I'm Bob Dickey, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. My guest today is Kevin Thompson. Kevin is the co-founder of the Thompson Burton Law Firm in Franklin, Tennessee. Kevin is a graduate of the University of Tennessee with a degree in political science, and then he went on to get his Juris Doctorate from the University of Tennessee School of Law. While at Tennessee, Kevin was an All-American decathlete, and he participated on two SEC and NCAA national championship teams. Kevin is also a serial entrepreneur with a wide range of investments and interests, but his passion has been to fundamentally redefine the art of law. In this podcast, we're going to understand a little bit more about that and what he's doing. Kevin continues to keep his finger on the pulse of multiple industries and the changes that are impacting life. And he has a keen sense, as Wayne Gretzky says, to skate to where the puck is going to be as opposed to where it is. And so we'll learn a little bit more about that as well. Spoiler alert, Kevin is also my brother-in-law as he married my sister, Sharon. He's incredibly smart, driven, and extremely hardworking. I greatly respect him as a husband, a father, and a friend. He's one of those incredible human beings that you consider yourself to be extremely blessed to know. I think this conversation is going to be fascinating and very informative. I know you're going to love the information that Kevin shares. So let's jump right in. Kevin Thompson, I tell you what, it's been a a while since we've had you on the podcast, and I'm super excited that you've been able to find some time to be back with us. Uh, I know you're dialing in from uh, your home in Franklin, Tennessee, and just want to say thank you for, for making the time to be with us today. I'm delighted to be here, and I can't wait for the conversation. Well, I figured we'd uh, take this maybe a little bit different direction. Uh, I just recorded uh, kind of a statement to uh, the audience here today, kind of giving a little bit of a recap of where we've been with the podcast and kind of what we did at the start and kind of how we've pivoted coming out of COVID. And uh, you have been with us previously. Uh, on some things that we've done. And I thought that uh, what I'd like to do is maybe go back and go a little bit deeper in your background and uh, maybe have you share some of your origin story uh, with the folks who are uh, fans of the pod. And one of the things that, you know, we've been talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and just getting their insights and how they're viewing the world and things that they're doing kind of post COVID and um, how they have their finger on the pulse of the economy and how they're changing their business and, how they're setting themselves up to have success in the future. But one of the things that I've uh, found interesting is that I think so much of a person's mental outlook and the frameworks that they use to kind of guide themselves for the future are really predicated on the things that they have done and experienced in the past. And one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that as I have seen you lead your family, you're a man who is uh, very motivated by uh, your family legacy. And if you take a look at the American dream and um, the th- what America stands for, you've got this iconic American story, this proud Italian heritage, uh, your grandfather coming over to the United States and all the various things uh, that your family accomplished. And th- these are stories that you tell your kids and it's, it's how you live your life. And there's a great deal of pride that you have with your, your family heritage. And I'd, I'd love for you maybe to share some of that story and, um, and, and let us know why that's so important to you. And how does that create like this foundation for you to be able to build on and give you strength as you kind of navigate the challenges and uh, as you're building towards the future? I love the subject, and and thanks for having me on. And usually when I'm on a podcast, people want my thoughts as a lawyer. Uh, What I really care about is uh, business and like like what we're talking about here, the economy, uh, family. Those things are very important to me, and I spend a lot of time thinking about those subjects. Uh, The family legacy is important because it it gives me a a framework to – well, let, let me cover the basics okay. of, of where my people came from. So my, my great-grandfather came from Genoa, Italy in 1905, and we, we heard his story, and, uh, and it was told frequently. And he came over by himself when he was a teenager, and he started a grocery store. And then his son, it's, it's the most impressive of all stories, he was the son of immigrants. My grandfather was very much a father figure to me. 
Joe Signiago uh, would go on. He was a bigger man for that period. He was 6'2", 220 pounds, and he'd play football at Notre Dame. Wow. And right here behind the computer, I wish you could see it. I've actually got a picture of his roster from the 1947 uh, national championship team. And so he was a this really. Is your, your, this is your grandfather who played for a national championship football team, Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah. three, three championship teams, actually, uh, 44, 45, and 47. And uh, he was just a, a tremendous figure in my life. Uh, and uh, not only was he an athlete, he served his country in World War II, mm -hmm. uh, also in the Korean War. And uh, kind of consistent with this theme of starting businesses, he found a way to own a beer distributorship. So he had the, the rights to uh, Miller and um, uh, Colt 45 and Schlitz and, and, and certain brands in Memphis. Uh, and, of course, he told the stories of his dad. I uh, observed him and his, his life. My mother... Out of necessity, she got a divorce in 1980. She started her own business of uh, selling promotional materials, which that was an era when women weren't supposed to be doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And so she's got some interesting stories about that. And so I observed her running her own business. And so hearing the stories and seeing how certain lives turned out, you know, we're, we're either pretty unemployable people uh, or we we have this belief that if you work hard enough, things work out, mm -hmm. that it's OK to take risk. Uh, my grandfather would say cheers to the risk takers, the people that came uh, over um, to, to have a better life here in America. And so th those made an impression on me. And it's important for me to tell those stories to my own kids. And so we we actually went to Genoa to see and just be a, be in that environment, and I think my kids understand uh, the story and the legacy. And also, there's another side of Italy where uh, my great grandmother came from, Ancona, mm -hmm. and uh, they were not entrepreneurial. They actually worked on, on a farm in Arkansas. Uh, but yeah, th those stories are important. I remember it was uh, at your wedding. You introduced me to uh, your grandfather, and it's still, you're you're you. You and I were younger than we are today, but there was this great awe and reverence, um, deference maybe that you had with your grandfather and just everything that he had accomplished and the man that he had been. Um, you've got you know, memorabilia there in your house, um, memorializing him. But I just, I remember that, right? And um, it just you know, how much respect that you had for him. And uh, you, you yourself have kind of taken uh, continued in his footsteps in many respects, uh, not only as a, a business leader, but you, you go on and uh, as a Tennessee boy, I mean, there, there in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, went to the University of Tennessee, uh, two-time All-American, uh, SEC championships, national championships. And you know, tell me a little bit about um, your, and I think you played football uh, for one, one season too, if I'm not mistaken. And so tell me a little bit about how uh, athletics uh, kind of helps set a foundation for you in your life and what you've you know, garnered from that, because uh, you and your wife are both phenomenal athletes. Your kids are great athletes. And I, I see you use that as a, um, a, a teaching right for your children. Curious as to, you know, your athletic background and pursuits and how that you know, impacts your life today. Uh, athletics was very formative for me, uh, and it boils down to uh, really one word, uh, humility, mm -hmm. and the humility comes from failure. So maybe that's two words. And so let me unpack that a little bit. Um, first, to slightly correct you, one time All-American, uh, I was at the national championship twice. Um, I, I got really sick the second time and couldn't finish. That was tough. So uh, with with Track and in, in, in the decathlon in particular, failure is absolutely part of the process. And not cataclysmic failure where you're out of the game completely, but it's uh, it, you submit to a process if, you, if there's a good coach, and, and we had a good coach. And year one, very few decathletes are ready to compete at a high level. But it, it happens mm -hmm. for, for really special and rare athletes. But in the decathlon, there's 10 events. And really, nine of them are very technically heavy. The mile is just 
survival. Mm-hmm. That doesn't really, you don't really train significantly for the mile. That's the last event in the decathlon. And for your, your listeners that might not know what the event is, it's 10 events over two days. So it's five events day one. It's a 100-meter dash, long jump shot put, high jump, 400. Day two is the hurdles, discus, pole vault, javelin, mile. And uh, it's a lot of losing. Because even for uh, an all-American decathlete like I was, you would do maybe four decathlons a year. That's it. And the rest of the time, uh, we'd be competing in an open event against people that all they did was high jump. And, of course, we'd lose, right? I I could high jump 6'10", but the seven-footers would kill me. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'd be competing with the shot putters. And, of course, they'd kill us. We'd be competing with the hurdlers. I'd, I'd, I'd practice on occasion with Justin Gatlin, who won a gold medal in 2004. Uh, and so you're getting just beat mm-hmm. <laughs> day in, day out, year in, year out, uh, event after event. And then those decathlons come along, and then things work out where maybe you win, maybe you, you, you get second or third. But uh, that really made a strong impression on me. And, and one thing I notice in myself that – that a lot of younger lawyers, I, I'm having a hard time teaching them, mm. is that uh, success compounds over time. Whereas if you have really good habits uh, and, and, and you subject yourself to constant feedback and, and, and you invest effort consistently over a long period of time, that the results, they're very, very slow and meager at first, maybe even embarrassing. And a lot of young people, and it feels so weird for me to say young people now that I'm not officially a young person, <laughs> but young people, they, they do not like that, that period of embarrassment where they just are bad and they can't really see how compounding works and they don't hang in there long enough for compounding works. And so that's where sports with me, I knew that I, I was perfectly okay being bad at something for years. Uh, because I knew ultimately this is how the process works. Mm-hmm. You just do it, and then right. you get better and stronger and smarter over time. But I, I wonder. It's interesting. I'd like to maybe dive a little bit deeper into that. You know, a stat that I was just referencing the other day was a uh, uh, Warren Buffett, and he, you know, greatest investor of his uh, generation, our generation, and the stat was that ninety nine percent of his wealth that he has today was generated after the age of 65. And, you know, I think at, at first blush, someone might say, well, this is an example of it's never too late to start. And actually that would be a, a wrong way of interpreting the data. Because the, the, the real way to interpret it, the data was uh, he got started when he was 14. And you were just talking about how success compounds over time. And really what happened was, is that it, he was, he talks about being able to be in the game long enough to allow time and compounding to work in your favor. And I think to your, to your point, there's a, we, we live in a society that there's a lot of instant gratification. I want success right away. It can be very difficult to be in an environment where it feels like you're chewing glass day in, day out. You're experiencing those failures. I think that's a lot of times when people are experiencing that if you're um, looking at it the right way and you're at least course correcting and you're making changes, you're making adjustments, you're actually probably laying a really strong foundation for your future success if you stay the course. But if you're constantly, hey, I'm going to go over here, I'm going to quit, I'm going to go over there, and you're, you're hopping all over the place, um, and you never really learn how to face adversity, face challenges, um, navigate failure. You're actually not growing the muscles that you need to grow for you to be successful. And that's kind of, in many respects, your story, your, those times where you were in those events where you were running up against an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, you're not winning then, but it was teaching you all the things that you needed to do. So when you were in the decathlon, you were able to um, have great success. I mean, w- w- how would you, how, how are you navigating those moments with your children? And with young attorneys, maybe in your in your law practice, to help them understand these concepts. I love I love that question because I think about it a lot. Before I, I get there, um, you mentioned Warren Buffett starting when he was fourteen. 
you know, I, I grew up with a single mother mm -hmm. and uh, the benefit was she wasn't a, a helicopter parent. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it can go one of two ways, right? If so, without a, a big parental influence, kids can make bad decisions and do bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit for me was I was given space and, and I had to learn how to do things on my own. Mm -hmm. And that was very apparent to me very early. It's if I'm going to be successful, I've got to figure it out. And she made that very clear. Her job was to give me an education. And then beyond that, I was on my own. Uh, and, and that created a, a, a little bit of uh, urgency in my mind in that it's up to me, you mm -hmm. know? So like a, a, an example would be in the Boy Scouts, father, son, and it, it's a great tradition. But it was me. I had to carve the car in the Pinewood Derby, and mm -hmm. I got killed. And and just these lessons occurred mm -hmm. that I've got to be uh, smarter and better and 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 more uh, agile. And, and I don't know if that made any sense. The mm -hmm. Pinewood Derby is where you carve the, yeah. you, you create a car and, and you race it down the, the hill. Um, I sucked at it. I was I sucked at a lot of things. Temporarily. Yeah. So how do I, you know, teach these to, uh, I'll, I'll start with, with younger lawyers. So okay. our firm, we've got, we started with, uh, originally it was the law office of me that was in 2008. Um, and th then it was, uh, Thompson Burton was born in 2012. Now we've got 35 attorneys. So we've got a business that's growing and, and people are doing well. Mm -hmm. Uh, these concepts it's uh, it's it's imp for me personally. I try not to overwhelm a young person. You need to take risk first. What I say is just do a great job and support the people around you, and mm -hmm. try to do what you can to make life better okay. for the people around you. Look for opportunities to make things better. Uh, a, a real example is we've got a a, a young attorney that we've uh, that we made an offer. He's not a lawyer yet. He's in law school, okay. and I said he's interested in AI. And, and I think AI is a, is a media you're heading for the legal profession. And I said, this is an opportunity for you. You need to learn this and, and help me understand how we can incorporate this in our business to help lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's all in. And it's great. And, and, and sadly, it, it is over my head. But, but that's an opportunity for a young person to distinguish himself and add value. Uh, I tell people to uh, create content. And, and write and not be afraid to put themselves out there. And that's where I notice some people do it, some people do not. And it's okay. Uh, but for, for people that need to, to feel like winners all the time, they're very risk averse. Mm -hmm. There's a cost associated with that. They, they, they don't get noticed. A great uh, analogy is the movie... Um, Achilles, uh, Troy, mm -hmm. Troy, Brad Pitt, very powerful scene. I think it's in the first five minutes of the movie. And his boy tells Achilles, I would never do that. And Achilles response is, that's why nobody will know your name. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there, there's the message. And so I try to encourage people to take risk. Uh, and when I see energy, I reward it, mm -hmm. I highlight it. I show people some of my early videos from like 2008 and they were terrible. I'm like, look at this idiot right here. Look at this idiot. Mm -hmm. You're better than this person. That idiot being me. And, but that person didn't say that didn't, didn't stay there. Mm -hmm. I, I iterated and, 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 and learned. And so that's, that's how I encourage younger people. It seems like today you, you talk a little bit about people being afraid to maybe create content put their name or their face out there and say, put the stake in the ground. This is what I believe and why, because once you do that, now you've taken a position, uh, you can be attacked and you're going to have to defend it. Um, so there's two things that you're going to have to be able to do. And there's a lot of people like, well, I don't want to say something where I'm going to, you know, face the wrath of somebody calling me out and saying I'm wrong or looking like I don't know what I'm talking about or having to defend my position. So it's very easy to kind of be in this, you know, non-committal world, right? I'm not going to commit, put myself out there. Uh, it's safe, but it's actually, I like how you stated it, that it's actually more risky. Um, there's a cost. There's a cost. Yeah. That's a, a way in which you built your firm. I remember back in the day when you, uh, 
launched your practice there in Franklin. And then it, it, it's just been, you know, it's easy now to sit back and say, oh, it's this juggernaut. You've got these beautiful, you have a beautiful office in Franklin. You've got this incredible office. I just toured through in downtown Nashville. Seems like every time I come over to visit you, uh, it's growing and it's expanding and all sorts of new things that are happening. But, um, you know, success looks like a straight uh, curve up and to the right uh, when you're looking at it in the rear view mirror. Uh, but at, at the at the time, uh, there's all sorts of risks. There was all sorts of risks that you were taking uh, to, you know, launch out on your own and, and start your practice. And um, you were... I remember uh, sitting in a, you, you came back to Knoxville and you were giving a lecture. You were uh, brought in as a guest lecturer at the University of Tennessee Law School. And I remember sitting in the back of the class uh, and just taking some notes as you were uh, lecturing you know, law students and you, and you were imploring them. It's like, guys, get out there, you know, put your stake in the ground, um, create content. This is what you have to do to brand yourself and to, and, and to gather a, uh, awareness on social media you were very early uh like a trailblazer um can you maybe recount some of those stories what were you thinking what, you know wh how did you what did you see and how were you navigating those times and then maybe how of how have things changed i mean are, are you changing your mo today or is it m very much the same okay uh so for me it was having a son so luke, my son luke was born in june of 2007 and then I realized, uh, you know, with kids, even with an infant, I knew more was caught than taught. Mm -hmm. I had to, I had to model behaviors that I thought would be helpful for my kids. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then it was, it was okay. It's my turn. Mm -hmm. It's time. So back to the family history. My great grandfather did it, and somehow, by the way, he started a grocery store. I got his picture somewhere uh, in here. Um, my grandfather did it. My mother did it. It's my turn. Mm -hmm. And there's a saying, desperation is a powerful motivator. And so um, when I started, it was, I, I it was lucky in that their uh, social media was just taking off. Mm -hmm. This would have been, like I said, 2008. Mm -hmm. So Facebook was around, but it wasn't being used by professionals. Mostly college kids and right. Absolutely college kids. And it was really for social networking, not really for, for branding. My competitors were older and had more experience. Mm -hmm. And so they, they did the networking thing. They'd go to events, they'd shake hands, pass out business cards, and they were known physically. But uh, I got going in an era where people were relying on Google more. So I was doing videos. I had a Facebook brand page, which I still have mm -hmm. uh, 20,000 followers, uh, which is 19999 more than most lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's one thing to have content. I, I realize you have to have distribution. Mm -hmm. so that's where making friends is important. Uh, creating content, not just content that's good, but content that spreads is different. Yeah. And where did that instinct come from? Uh, it was when, when 2008 as well, I launched a social network for law students called Advanced Advocates. And the thinking was it's like Facebook, for, but for law students. And it was a disaster. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, but I, again, this is part of the, the, the theme of learning from failure. It's I learned a lot about how Google works. I learned a lot about the importance of uh, people connecting on social and sharing content. Mm -hmm. And so that made a really strong impression on me where, okay, well, I've got a, uh, and it's, there's, there's no magic bullet when it comes to my business or any, any professional that wants to brand themselves. It's a spider web. It's just a whole lot of things that sort of layer on top of each other. And yeah, I started writing. I, I uh, sued a company and that was, that was uh, very public and got a lot of attention and I think it's important to, if, 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 uh, and I guess I'm, I, I have a, I have credibility to talk about lawyers in particular, mm -hmm. but I think this applies to all entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's important to have uh, the right friends. It's okay if you have the right enemies. Mm -hmm. It's okay. And, and I'm not talking about political speech where you have to have an opinion about trans, transgender bathrooms. 
I'm just saying taking a position in a certain field that people might not agree with Mm -hmm. and being okay in that kind of environment. Uh, And not everybody is. And so they don't do it. What's your take on, um, as as folks are taking positions, right? As I, it's just odd, maybe listening to you talk about this and I'm, there's people in my life that will, that I know who take just crazy positions on all sorts of things. I'm like, you really don't, you don't deserve to have an opinion on this because you have no idea what you're talking about. Or maybe you do, but it's just like, no one's going to listen to you. It's like, there's some people who just want to be out there and, you know, throw Molotov cocktails at everything. And then you've got the, the, the flip side of that coin is someone who is just scared to death to be, to say anything, to take a stand on anything, just because I don't want someone to, you know, my next door neighbor to think bad of me, or I don't, I don't want to put myself out there. So you've got those two poles, right? Um, For how do you, and I guess maybe in your career and profession, a legal profession, you're having to take stands. I mean, there's issues that are black and white, and you also have to navigate the nuance of a, a lot of the gray in the middle, but how do you help people uh, or what words of, advice would you give folks out there how to take a nuanced position and do it the right way? Any of your legal background, your, your training in terms of, um, you know, how, how to make, how to take a stand, how to, how to advocate for your position and, and do it in a way where you're going to be noticed or you'll make a difference. Yeah, there's, there's probably multiple ways to do it. For me, I would recommend diving really, really deep on a, on a nuanced issue. Mm-hmm. And so th- this is where, you know, is this relevant for entrepreneurs in general? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but for me, it's diving deep and, and having some credibility on one thing. And then, and then that might give you a platform to talk about other things. I'll give you a real example. Something that's really interesting to me is uh, that I think is an opportunity for young entrepreneurs in general and young lawyers, especially is, is crypto. Mm-hmm. So crypto, uh, it's going to be around. There's going to be a regulatory framework. The regulatory framework doesn't exist, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the current SEC will disagree and say the old rules are fine. But those rules are being written in real time. So uh, th- a, a real example would be somebody in that space. There's lots of opportunities to, to have opinions on, well, how should, for example, um, uh, stable coins, uh, the U.S. dollar coin. How mm-hmm. should that be regulated? Lots of opportunities to to lead a discussion and participate in a discussion about stuff like that. Um, so for me, I'm drawn to the 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 cleaner the space, the more well defined the rules, mm-hmm. the less opportunity there is. Oh, that's interesting. In my opinion, because there's lots and lots of people that have tilled that soil. The messier it is, uh, that to me is opportunity from a content standpoint and and from really a business standpoint. That's really interesting insight. So the areas where it's pretty black and white, you can draw the lines clearly, maybe not as much opportunity. Areas where it's gray, less defined, a lot of of nuance. there's an area to kind of stake out some claim. And, uh, but the other thing that I also find very interesting and insightful is that you said, go deep. There's a lot of people that you'll see today that they, they want to have a strong opinion on a subject and their, their breadth or experience in that subject is they've read one or two tweets on Twitter or they saw a Facebook post and now they're an expert and your counsel is no, no, hold on go become an expert dive deep into some subject matter become an expert on it then start sharing your opinions or your insights share share the nuance the things that you're reading discovering to help educate other people and to bring them along i i I love um you know, I, I love that insight. And, you, and a, a couple minutes ago, you also mentioned, so you said, hey, there's some interesting insight here with, with crypto. I'd love to come back on it because I know that you have uh, researched and gone down that rabbit uh, trail uh, with your legal profession. Um, but I also, it, you said there's some interesting insights there, but then you were also, a few moments ago, you're recruiting a kid out of college. He's still in law school and you're like, hold on a second. There's, and the, the words you used, this, there's an AI meteor heading for the legal profession 
and almost as if there's there's this coming cataclysmic event. Tell me, well, tell me, what do you see with uh, with AI and how that is going to impact? Because you're telling this kid, hey, go deep in this area. This is new. This is right. Yeah, gr- gr- gra- strap yourself to the asteroid coming to the planet. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> uh, I, you know, is it going to end the profession? I don't think so. Uh, that's that's a very massive question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know with 100 percent certainty it will absolutely change our business and anybody else that sells information. So lawyers provide value by uh, understanding the complex and the arcane and presenting it in a way that that makes sense for people, helping people make decisions. And if, for example, Bob, you rely on my advice and it's bad advice, you have protection because you can be like, well, hey, my lawyer said it's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, It provides protection for people. Uh, so there's need for it. Now with chat GBT, it can create, I'll give you an example, uh, a landlord tenant contract. Mm-hmm. So let's suppose you have a, uh, a rental property and you don't want to pay a lawyer $5,000. Uh, you can put in some basic prompts, dra- draft me a landlord tenant agreement between, um, my business and a tenant for $2,500 a month with a $6,000 security deposit with a 24 month term. I don't know. Yeah. And factor in a 3% inflation bump. Uh, and it will get you 80 to 80 to 90% there. Okay. So the, the lawyer today that think linearly that, that they, they don't really have much business acumen. They think linearly, they think, well, that's where the lawyer provides value. They close that 10% gap. Fair point. Okay. That's that is the case today. So I have a rough draft. Basically, I have a rough draft. I take my rough draft and hey, I don't. I don't need ten hours worth of your work. I need two hours. Just gussy it up. Put you know, put some lipstick on this pig, right? Charge me two hours. That's, that, that, yes, that's today. Okay. What, what I what I'm what I'm anticipating is that 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 twenty percent delta mm-hmm. from what the AI can give you versus what a lawyer can give you. That twenty percent delta is going to shrink. Mm-hmm. rapidly. So I know that's coming. And mm-hmm. so then I think it'd be very short-sighted for anybody to say, well, but that's just for low-end deals. Well, that's that's the example I'm giving you today, mm-hmm. March 1st, 2023. Right. But March 1st, 2024, maybe it can do a commercial contract between a, and a commercial real estate transaction. Maybe there's a way for this thing. There, there's going to be a, a, an AI bot that can handle a divorce or a parenting plan. Mm-hmm. Um, that can can ha- that 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 can process input from a certain jurisdiction based on trends in this area. Here's your parenting plan. I, I think it's a very serious thing coming, uh, and it's important to understand it. Well, did you see that with like uh, how did Legal Zoom impact your business? Because what that I would imagine that there's a lot of people now like, hey, I want to pay my fifteen ninety five a month or whatever it is, twenty bucks a month, and I have access to Legal Zoom, and you know it's just this repository of all sorts of contracts and documents. You get it, you know, it's a you know carbon copy of something. Um, now I I don't know anybody seriously that uses that for all their business deals. They still use a, 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 a an attorney who's able to get them into the the the, the nuance and. Um, so I'm assuming that you're looking at chat GPT in a similar fashion. There's going to be some people who will use it for that basic stuff. Folks that I'm talking to are saying, okay, look, there, there's going to be a, certainly job destruction, but the proper framework to look at chat GPT is not how is it going to dis- destroy jobs, but rather how will it augment current thought leaders to be able to be uh, produce more and to be more effective, right? To where, so are you, I'm assuming that that's kind of maybe how you're looking at it from a law, a law firm is like that this is almost like a, an assistant that is going to make every single one of your 35 lawyers, soon to be 40 lawyers, w- way more high power, be able to churn out more, more stuff, service more clients. Is that, is that, am I correct in looking at it that 100%, way? hundred percent. Yes. That's, that's where that's it, it, one option is to just shut the business down and we're done. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that's the case. Another is we need to learn how to make this available to the partners at the firm where they can use it and it helps them do their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've used it actually uh, uh, in, in, in real time, but in reality, I, I, I wanted to write a letter to my senators, didn't know where to start. Mm-hmm. I'm not super politically active, but there was an issue that was important to me. I put in a few prompts. It was absolutely incredible. 
And so I think making that tool available, and, and I think Microsoft is going to is going to incorporate it in their products. But um, yes, you you asked about LegalZoom. LegalZoom did end low end corporate work. Mm-hmm. So in the old days, you had to go to a lawyer, and it cost about a thousand dollars to create an entity. Mm-hmm. That's gone. Yeah. So uh, the 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 lower end stuff will go. I think AI. These robots are able to do higher end work. They're mm-hmm. able, I think, to exercise. But the value a good lawyer brings is years of experience and judgment. I think that that, that data is out there that can be uh, that can be what's the word um, trolled mm-hmm. or used. You know, AI needs data. So right. you, data is out there where these bots can actually have pretty good judgment. That's what I'm anticipating. Okay. There's a book that I read recently that I found absolutely fascinating. I think it uh, somewhat applies here, but I know of, um, it was probably in vogue maybe 10, 15 years ago. Maybe it was Seth Godin. Went, uh, no, it wasn't Seth Godin. It was Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours, right? Where he's like, hey, you, you want to go deep in a, a particular domain. You want to be an expert in this really narrow you know, field. And there was another author that came out. Uh, Epstein was his is the uh, but range is the, the the title of the book, and his uh, thesis of the book is actually as we're moving into this new global economy where the information is ubiquitous. You know, everyone's carrying around in their pocket the wisdom of you know Solomon. Basically, um, it's more important for you to have a wide range of experiences to be able to understand a, a wide range of industries and so forth. And so, and you'll be able to take all this data, all these various experiences that you've had, that this breadth of experience and be able to see the patterns, be able to connect dots, understand how to take all this information and put it into some type of, um, you know, format that's usable. Right. I, and I found the book absolutely fascinating, but it, it yeah. seems like, you know, so now that we've got this AI is going to do that. And where uh, an attorney like yourself, or let, let's take a look at other uh, professions, maybe a doctor, it's going to be um, the ability to be able to tap into that information and say, okay, I, great, I've got all this now, but here's how I'm going to use it. The insights to be able to you know, leverage it. Yeah, I agree. And that requires judgment. It requires a little bit of risk-taking. It requires curiosity. And it's, uh, I've, I've learned that not everybody is really curious. Some people just want to be told what to do, mm-hmm. but it's the curious people that tinker mm-hmm. with stuff and they, they, they learn, uh, they learn about the tools that are available. That's, that's really important. Let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey as you're starting off. Um, you know, just a second ago, we we're talking about the, some of the new maybe sectors that you want to get involved in. You're, you're going to a, uh, law schools and hiring someone to, you know, be an expert in AI, you're getting involved in cryptocurrencies and blockchain and, but your, your law firm now, 35, uh, attorneys and growing, but when it was just you, and then it was, uh, you and Walt, Walt Burton for Thompson Burton, uh, go back, if you will, and, and go down memory lane and be, th- what were you thinking when you were building this? So it, we're, were you intentional and knew it's like, okay, I'm, I have this talent or I'm a, I'm a lawyer in these particular areas and I'm going to get a partner who has this right here. And I think Walt, he's in real estate. Um, what, what, and then were you very intentional be like, okay, now we want to go into corporate law and then we want to go into, you know, was it that intentional or are you just waiting for the, the, the right person to be like, Hey, you know what? That's a, that, that guy, that gal, um, they, they would be a good cultural fit. Let's add them in. I mean, how, how did you, how were you thinking about and building this company? Was it spontaneous and as, as you know, luck would bring people to you? Or are you really intentional on how you're designing this? I just want to, you know, peel back the layers of the onion because I mean, the tagline, uh, for your firm is redefining the art of law. And, uh, you're doing things that are unique and distinctive there. I mean, and then you had this vision all the way back in 2008, 2009, I mean, I know as I've watched you execute on it uh, and how you're displacing big law firms and, you're, you're, uh, and the things that you're doing, I was just like, it, it's just fascinating. So I, I'd love to learn a little more. Uh, okay. Bigger picture would be, you know, something that, that, that your audience can, can, that might be actionable is, mm-hmm. you know, 
be a person uh, worthy of a good partnership. Mm-hmm. And uh, an obvious example would be a spouse or a significant other, a partner in that way. It's it's modeling good behaviors and, and finding ways to serve the other person as much as humanly possible and ask for very little. And uh, I, I think that's an important attitude to have, a, a good partnership. Good partnerships aren't 50-50 arrangements. That's a really, I think it's a bad way to look at it because everybody quantifies value differently. Mm-hmm. And if I think a deal, Bob, between you and I is 50-50, you might think it's more like 70-30, me, you know, me unfair to you. Um, and so because we, we have different, uh, different subjective criteria we're looking mm-hmm. at. And so uh, with, with Walt, he's a tremendous partner, and I, and I view it very similar to, to a marriage. It's a very important relationship. Mm-hmm. It's important that he trusts me and I trust him, and I try to find as many opportunities as I can to support him and help him be a, a better lawyer. Uh, and so that, that number one is, is really important. So being the kind of person that somebody else would, would want to partner with, it's not just an idea. It's who you are as a man, as a woman. Mm-hmm. That's first and foremost. And so taking yourself seriously, uh, and, and when you do that, other people will take you seriously. So number one, uh, yeah, it, it really, it wasn't, um, I like your practice area. Let's marry these, you know, my practice area with yours. Let's put those two together. It's, I can work with you. And he had strengths that I didn't have. Mm-hmm. And I had strengths that he didn't have. And we just, uh, early on, we made the decision. One, one thing that, that, that we did right early was we created, we, we focused on, let me back up a little bit. A lot of other businesses, it's very subjective as far as how people are paid. Well, this person is part of this deal, or this person's been here longer, or this person does these, you know, uh, CLE the seminars, mm-hmm. and uh, that's pretty much what everybody does. We said we want this to be objective, where everybody knows the deal, no mm-hmm. special deals. And actually, Bob, you made an impression on me a long time ago, and in, in the business I was in-house counsel working for you, uh, two thousand seven to two thousand nine. Um, and it's 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 transparency that was important to us, and so we created a, a very transparent system. Uh, that 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 has attracted lawyers. Yes, we are intentional about the lawyers that we prefer, but sometimes we, we we get lawyers from certain practice areas that we weren't really targeting, but it's good for business, and we bring them on. Um, we didn't start the firm thinking we'd be one of the best family and domestic law firms in Middle Tennessee. We are. Mm-hmm. We've got the best divorce lawyers in Middle Tennessee. Uh, they, they like our model mm-hmm. and, and the environment that we create for, for them and, and their clients. Uh, so s- summarizing it, uh, sometimes we, we do target certain people mm-hmm. and certain areas because we think that would augment, hey, I'm, I'm kicking off a lot of disputes, a lot of litigation. We need somebody that can handle that. Sometimes that's okay. part of it. But really, it's, it, it's a field of dream situation where if you build it, they come. We have a good model, and for me personally, I'm, I'm fairly good and interested in tech. So we've we've got good tech that calculates all the commissions every single month, and it's it's very transparent. That's been sort of the secret to our success. It just it reminds me of a Charlie Munger quote where he said that as you're building a business, invest upwards of seventy five percent of his time on the incentive structure. He said, if you get the incentives right, everything else will work. And so you've got this model of transparency and it's also an entrepreneurial model that's maybe not as uh, common in some of these other law practices uh, in in Nashville or around the country. I just recently, I was in your uh, Nashville office. My wife and I were getting uh, some legal work done. And I was chatting with one of the attorneys that was helping with us. And I said, Hey, just, you know, give me your insight. Tell, tell me, you know, what like, you could tell he was just like, he lit up and he was like, man, I just, I just, I love the entrepreneurial spirit here. And I love this. And he worked at previously 
a another really big law firm downtown Nashville and said, this is why I came here. And he and it, are, are you able to uh, double click on the the, um, the difference of your um, the, the incentives in the comp structure? Is that kind of like top secret or are you able no, to? It's not, no, okay. it's not top secret at all. Uh, we actually have a we published a calculator on our website where people can plug in their own numbers mm -hmm. and they can see what they'd be paid. And uh, at other places, w without naming any names, uh, right. some of the larger firms, mm -hmm. there's a committee somewhere. Mm -hmm. And typically these committees are older people that might not be as productive, mm -hmm. but they have influence in how the, how the compensation works. And of course, they structure it in a way where a lot of the senior people, they're drinking from the trough. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the comp decisions it's subjective criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to summarize it more succinctly than that. It's a, a real example is we have a female attorney. Uh, she came to our firm and actually her hours dropped, but her income doubled. Well, that's a rare situation, wow. but clearly she was not getting a good deal where she was at. Right. Uh, so she's a producer and the, the partners in that firm were figuring out a way. So it's like, hey, we want to take some pretty big sips from this trough. Exactly. Exactly. And they, 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 for whatever reason, they held back bonuses and they, the, the comp, they, they gave her equity points, but what good are equity points if you're adding more equity points to the overall pot? And right. I, I've been in this business for a long time. I still don't understand how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I guess a lot of these older establishments, they're, they're just now learning that people can leave. Mm -hmm. Whereas historically, that wasn't always the case. You could really tighten the screws on somebody. And where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. uh, and so right now we, we sort of provide an option for people. And that, that's how we're growing. Yeah, uh, awesome. People that, that have established businesses that aren't quite making what they think they should be, they're, they're bringing it over. That's the secret to our success. And yeah, we, we focus heavily on the incentives. That's usually our default. Mm -hmm. It's how can we give people skin in the game? with these decisions. So somebody wants more resources. How can we, we, we toggle it to where they uh, make that investment? Let's say somebody needs a new paralegal. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, hire the person if you need it so bad, and you keep the vast majority of what that person produces. That's us trying to, to, to bring people in on these decisions. Um, so they, they have skin in the game. That's very important. That's awesome. Well, a, a few seconds ago, you were highlighting uh, some of the things that you look for when you, you are looking for a partner and you gave some uh, great commentary there for entrepreneurs, maybe even young entrepreneurs who are thinking about, say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to launch my business and I'm looking for a partner or I'm going to be in partnership. Uh, are there things that you've learned over the years as you have either, I mean, and maybe we can get into this in a few minutes, but I mean, you're a serial entrepreneur yourself. I mean, you're, you're not only a uh, very accomplished attorney in multiple different uh, disciplines, but you've been in the franchising business. You've been in a, a whole host of, of various entrepreneurial pursuits. And uh, what, what do you, or what have you seen as red flags? Like if, as, as you're vetting a business, or you're maybe vetting a business partner who's like, hey, I have an idea, Kevin, let's go together and let's go do this. Are there, over time, what are the red flags that you see that you say, ah, this is a caution. This, this is something that, you know, um, I, I won't go down this path if I see this because I've just, I've seen it not end well. Any, any words of caution for young people? I'll, I'll give uh, good factors I look for and, and, and bad things I look for. Uh, but first, serial entrepreneur, I, I appreciate the description. I, I guess I have done a lot of different things and they haven't all been successful. So I'm, I'm open about losing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's part of the process of learning. And it's through those experiences, I think it's helped me with my judgment. So you mentioned the franchising. We owned a cycling studio. We lost a lot of money in that deal. Learned a lot, lost a lot. Uh, I am the proud owner, I think I can say, of a cannabis business in Oregon. And I'm connecting with my old teammates. And talk about just filling the heart. Mm -hmm. I just, it's, it's just so special for me to hang out with old friends. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a lot of fun. Now, that business actually is making money. Uh, and then I, I own several properties that, that I rent out. So pretty basic real estate deals. 
Um, and I might be forgetting something. Of course, I, I love crypto. Mm-hmm. And so I, 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 I do that. Um, when I'm looking at resumes, if, if all of the accomplishments are in a, what I call sort of a walled garden, then it's not really impressive to me. So, so for example, if all of the, if the entire resume includes experiences from a school, big deal. So uh, it would be an example, of course, your degrees. Mm-hmm. And in the legal business, it'd be moot court champion and then law review editor and um, uh, this fraternity in the school and um, served as a clerk to this professor. Everything is safe. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just don't feel good when I see that. Um, and it, it could be a bias of mine that's not very healthy, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I, that's not super impressive. I like uh, a little bit of diversity. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for example, um, people that I've obviously military service, which, by the way, thank you for your service. Um, people that uh, that make decisions, honor commitments and can commit to long-term projects. That to me is interesting. So military experience is is an obvious one. Um, College athletics, yeah, I'm biased, but they've been on a team and they know how to lose. Mm -hmm. That's important. They know how to take risk. I also think personal health is, is is a signal for success. People that invest in their health, they have more energy. I think that's important. And uh, of course, other Maybe, you know, for example, we we work with somebody who uh, went to Thailand to help with sex trafficking. That's interesting. That's such a real risk. They got on an airplane and went somewhere uh, and lived in a weird country or something they felt strongly about. So that's uh, good signs that I look for. Red flags. Oh, you said you've had one already. You're just like, you're kind of like this wall garden that didn't take a whole lot of risk. Cause you lack, like, of, lack of diversity. Yeah. In that walled garden context. I mean, you, if you've made a friend with the right person, the professor, whatever, um, you can go pretty deep, right? Like that, that'll open up a lot of doors, but you want to, for me, I mean, to kind of build on uh, that idea that you've um, put out there. Um, a person who's been able to figure out ways in which they open up doors in a lot of different areas, had success in a lot of different places. It, you, you know, it's not just one lucky break, right? But it has been like this, this individual, this gal is doing something right consistently. And there's a lot of thought leaders who are seeing her in, a, in different industries, different backgrounds, whatever. And she's finding her way in and opening up these doors and having success. I mean, so there, there's like this trend line. I think I forget who it was recently. There was a, um, a venture capitalist out of Silicon Valley, and he, he wrote a blog post. And he said, don't invest on the dot, invest on the line. And, you know, you talk about the trend, right? Because it's really easy yeah. to have. There's a there's a moment in time where you can put a point on a graph and say, oh, wow, isn't this great? Like, yeah, why don't you get three or four more of those dots and see where that line is trending, right? For sure. Yeah. There's somebody in my office who um, her story is remarkable. She went to night school for law mm-hmm. school and she's hungry and uh, just shooting up like a rocket. Mm-hmm. That, that is interesting. So so her now. Now, yes, yeah, some people are more advantaged than others, and that's OK. Nothing wrong mm-hmm. with that. What do you do with those opportunities? What did you do with that advantage? Mm-hmm. Did you improve the situation? Um, that's what I'm looking for. And and and. Now, with with the economy is changing so fast, and we talked about AI, Mm -hmm. it's not what it used to be where you just kind of get settled in, and and if you just mind your business and support somebody, you can make a decent living. Mm -hmm. The concepts we're talking about here, it's like, how do you you be exceptional? Somebody that wants to be just, they just want to get by and pay their mortgage, that's fine. It was easier five years ago to do that. I think now the cheese is moving so fast. Uh, it's important to have a mindset of that they're willing to try stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's that's really important. Well, if you, I, I want to get your insight on you know, how to be that type of em, employee or entrepreneur or just person in life that is looking to consistently upskill, uh, upskill. Um, becoming a lifelong learner. You know, moving very quickly. I it, I always think of you. 
uh, when I hear the the quote, the famous you know uh, Gretzky quote, you said, "Well, I've, I've been successful in hockey because I I skated to where the puck was going to be, not where it was." And as I look in your career, it, it feels like you have just had these incredible insights to be able to skate to where the puck was going, whether it was in um, real estate or whether it was in the legal profession or whether it was in investments. Um, so the, the world is changing rapidly. And uh, we, we've talked a little bit about how you see the legal profession changing, but for young people out there, say even mid-career professionals who are wanting to stay abreast, are there things that you've learned uh, in your career, uh, to help you maybe have some of these insights? Um, you know, how have you put yourself in position to either, um, to, to gain these, the, these insights or this knowledge? I, I also recently heard a quote that, you know, the, um, our success in life is oftentimes we're down, it's downstream of the information that we're consuming. That's another thing that I, I, I know about you is that you're con- constantly consuming, information and getting data that allows you to make good decisions for your family, for your business. So how do you think and process about that? What, what, what are you doing or what words of advice would you give people like, Hey, I want to get my hands on some of that data. I want some of those insights. I want to skate to where the puck is going to be. It, it, there, there's a lot to unpack. So what worked for me might not work for other people. Mm-hmm. And I do not pretend and, and back to the humility. And it's hard to it's hard to say you're humble when you say that's one of your strengths. I think my humility is my strength. <laughs> uh, I know that I can lose. I am keenly aware that I can lose and I have lost. And so for me, with some decisions, I try to automate. So when it comes to investing, I'm a big believer in automation. Um, that's one of the benefits of real estate investing. It, it does go slow. So it removes a lot of human judgment from the equation. When it comes to investing in equities, I'm a big believer, in just automation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a separate deal. So advice for uh, younger people, it is to be aware of the information you're being consumed. And so personally, I do like podcasts. Uh, I do like listening to podcasts while I'm working out. That's a double benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, some of my, my best ideas and best feelings come after listening, listening to good content. Uh, I do read. It's important for me to read. And my wife reminds me of that. She says, uh, you feel better when you're reading. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that was a really good observation. So I think it's important to, to read. It's important to, to be mindful of the content being consumed. Be careful with news. Be careful with Twitter. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think being aware of what's entering your mind. Advice for young people, I think we've covered a lot yeah. already. It would be, though, that uh, well, if, if I were starting over, and I'm I'm uh, 25, fresh out of school. I would do anything. I, I would I would do whatever it took to get in uh, people's orbit. I would do whatever. I, I would do laundry. There's nothing beneath me. I would do whatever it took to have a coffee with somebody. And, and I think it's very lazy to just think that uh, for someone to assume that they're entitled to a coffee with a successful person, mm-hmm. they need to earn the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't see a lot of that. Um, uh, I'm, I, I appreciate it when I see the energy. I reward it. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we, we do have a young lawyer, and she's like, I've got an idea to write an article about this. I'm all over it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, that's great. Do it. I don't care what it says. Do it. We'll publish it. Um, so so trying, to, to, trying to add value to the people around you in ways that might not just be about the business you're in. Mm-hmm. It could be, and, and people are like, well, that's just beneath me. I worked at a state park when I was 21. There, there was, there's no job mm-hmm. beneath me. Um, and I think it's really important just to understand the, the, the value that, that you bring as a young person. It's not a lot. And so to find as many opportunities as possible, I think that's, that's important. So relationships are key. Absolutely, yes. Building relationships. Um, I, I, I have stories, but I'm, I don't want to get into all that. But well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, did, I, did, I played racquetball, for example, mm-hmm. with with partners, um, and it, it was it was not fun for me. But and then that's not just kissing ass. It was he needed somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I took care of a guy's 
a pet. I volunteered to do it. I'll do it. I'll take care of your dog. You know, what, what, what self-respecting lawyer does that? I did it. Mm-hmm. And it's just trying to find opportunities to, to create value. Build relationships. Yeah, I, I remember early in my career, one of my first mentors outside the military said, Bob, it's, business is really easy. It's all about relationships. Just it's just it's relationship, relationship, relationship. So, um, yeah. A- any insight there on uh, how you have uh, built relationships over the course of your career? I mean, you've, you've, you've highlighted maybe a little bit. A little bit. I uh, just want to make see if there's anything else you want to add on the relationship aspect of business. Or well, I, I guess uh, I'm not naturally extroverted. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, Steve Martin has this quote: "Be so good they can't ignore you." For me, it's been all, it's always about creating content, pushing it out there, and the right people are drawn to me. And also, the wrong people are repelled mm-hmm. from me. So I'm not afraid to say, uh, this company is a disaster, okay? Um, something, somebody from a very big law firm would never say that. I say it. And so it repels certain opportunities, but it also attracts the right kind of opportunities. Um, and, and also, it's, it's being mindful of the, this really key question. Mm-hmm. What are you optimizing for? Yeah. Right? Because in life, there's lots of priorities. What are you optimizing for? And for me, it's uh, one of my, my main priorities. It's not just to build a big, scary business and change the world. I'm not mm-hmm. trying to, to change the environment. I'm not trying to um, you know, bend the universe in a special way, personally. Um, for me, it's it's my wife and my family, mm-hmm. and that's that's one thing. Back to the story of my grandfather, he made a really strong impression on me that when you invest heavily in in the people in your immediate orbit, you can have a great life. Mm-hmm. Okay, we all we all want to go to Hawaii and and be on a beach forever, and you get to live there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we 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 all want to have this idyllic life. We think, but really, it boils down to what's life like at the breakfast table. Mm-hmm. Because that's every day. What's life like when you're having coffee with your wife? That's every day. Mm-hmm. I optimize for that. And if that's good, then I'm able to, to take risk in my business. I'm able to do things in my business because at the end of the day, if I lose there, I'm still okay. Such a brilliant insight. So such a brilliant insight. Because like, everybody's got their dream board of, if I just have this house, this car, vacation here, if I can have this net worth, I'm going to be happy. And you can spend your entire life optimizing for a dream board and be absolutely miserable. Um, but you know, you, you intuitively understand optimize for those, those moments, those everyday moments from the breakfast table in the morning to laying in bed late at night, reading a book or having coffee with your wife. And if you're, and if you are getting those happy moments every single day in your loving life, you're no matter all the other things take care of themselves. And if you never achieve them, it's like, eh, who cares, but I'm living my best life and I'm in, I'm enjoying these moments. Massively important. Uh, a, a, a brief story. Um, my grandfather, he passed away in 2007, early 2007. He fell and broke his leg, uh, getting the mail on Christmas night. Mm-hmm. Don't know why it was out there. It was wet. It happened. He, he broke his hip and his femur. Mm. So I rode to the hospital with him, and I kind of knew this is how it happens, mm-hmm. right? Old people, they fall. They go to the hospital. They don't come out. Mm-hmm. And I asked him. Uh, it was kind of like that movie City Slickers, right? What's the one thing? Mm-hmm. Was what? What I asked him, what was the, what was the main thing in, that you think led to your success in life? And it's an unfair question to ask a man on his deathbed uh, to boil down his life to one concept. It's kind of lazy. But I asked it. And he just, he just said it was so simple. He said, I love my wife. That was it. That was it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not super profound, but it, 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 that's how he lived his life. He focused on his family first mm-hmm. and the business always came second and the business was always in good shape, mm-hmm. but he had a really good life because he had a very strong relationship at home. And that made a very powerful impression on me. Um, and I'll never forget it. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you had that opportunity with him. And what- yeah, he was on his deathbed. Wow. 
Well, um, it, it's a it's a good reminder that things happen quickly. I was just you, know, you and you highlight that moment there where he slip and fell. I mean, there was uh, Brandy and I were down in Pensacola uh, this past fall, and we were you know just in, in a hotel lobby, and Br- she, Br- I was doing some work, and Brandy was riding an elevator up, and she I call him an old codger. She laughs at me when I call old people an old codger. I don't know where I came up with that term, but it's just, but she, she meets the, this guy is as, as adorable as the day is long. His name was, um, Walter Dubfields. He w- and they, he was there, um, in Pensacola with his, uh, class of naval aviators for the class of 1958. They're a big reunion, right? And so Brandy starts talking with them and, uh, they invited us to ha- hang out and spend some time with them. And I just, I, I could just get, I got this sense. I was like, when's the last time I've been around a whole bunch of guys who are, they're telling stories about Vietnam and the Cuban Missile Crisis and um, the Korean War. And I just like, hey, can I just pull out my podcasting equipment and just th- throw this on the table and just like listen and ask questions? And so I, I, I you know, took the moment to do this, right? And I got a phone. So it's, it's one of the podcasts that are, 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 is out there. And, um, I got a phone call. Oh gosh, it must have been January, late late December, uh, January. And the guy who started this whole thing, Walter Fields, he lived in Minnesota with his family, and his son called me up and said, "Bob, um, my dad slipped and fell on the ice and passed away." And I mean, this was literally weeks after Brandy and I had met him, and we had recorded that. It's one of those things that you just like, you never know when that, when you have this moment to speak to somebody where it could be your, now this, this wasn't my grandfather, but it, you know, he made an impression on me, just that brief moment g- giving advice. And so I just, I don't know, send it out to the, and, and all the folks listening is that, you know, take those moments, you know, like you had a, anytime you have an opportunity to speak to somebody who's a generation older than you, older than us, glean w- nuggets and words of wisdom. Um, yeah, you know, they're not going to steer you wrong, right? They, they, they've, they've got scars. They've lived a, a long time, and being able to distill that down at, at, and into such and it may seem like it's such a simple statement. Hey, I just love my wife, but there's so much that one statement is so rich and so powerful and so much wrapped up into it because you think that all that goes into I just loved my wife, and you know that legacy lives on with you because I see how you know you. Um, have organized your life, optimized it for your family, for your kids, for your wife, Sharon, uh, for those just probably listeners who don't know that, you know, your wife, Sharon is my sister. So, um, and I've, I've, I've had a front row seat to see how you, you do that with your family and you do it quite well. And it's, it's very impressive. So it's a privilege. Um, back, back to your comment with, uh, the elderly, it's, they're in a position where they don't care about their brand or reputation or, ego Mm -hmm. it's um they just are able to state the conclusion yeah there's value in that yeah unvarnished unvarnished right unvarnished and it's just like it's raw and it's it's real and it's like they've got no reason to like try to um tell you something that's not so uh as we're maybe coming to uh the the end of uh, our time together um, man, we've, we've covered so much here. I, is there anything in particular that you w- wanted to talk about that we didn't, that I didn't, I didn't, is there a, a topic or is something that you wanted to share that, I, that what, what's a question that I didn't ask that I should have? I've, I've enjoyed it. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, you, you, you might have questions about thoughts on the economy in 2023. Yes. yes. I'm not really, you know, I have an opinion like everybody else, but th- th- these are really confusing times. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when, when the subject of the economy comes up, I just, I, I just focus on what I'm good at and go to work mm-hmm. every day and work hard. And I think it'll work, it'll, it'll work out. I, I think we're, we're in for a bumpy road this year, mm-hmm. uh, but um, we're going to come out the other side and I think be better for it. Well, since you are someone who uh, knows a lot about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and you've gone down that rabbit hole of studying and analyzing a lot of things that I'm seeing in the last number of days revolve around the SEC coming out and making statements that they believe that virtually every cryptocurrency or project is going to be seen as a security except for Bitcoin. Can you help me understand that statement? Do you believe that that is going to be 
uh, that's true, that they're going to classify everything as a security but Bitcoin? Or do you feel that that is uh, maybe an incorrect statement? It's just maybe hyperbole and just getting stuff out there in the news. It's uh, it's not true. And uh, but so that, that this is a really big subject. Um, and the SEC, the, the, the law that they're using comes from legislation written in 1931. Okay. Uh, as far as what is and is not a security. If something is considered a security, it's, it's, it's an investment where there's an expectation of passive returns. Mm-hmm. If something's a security, it has to run through regulated brokers, and uh, it's not easy to, to exchange securities. I'm, it's not easy for me to, to, to give you a security, for mm-hmm. example. And so if everything is a security in Bitcoin, uh, in crypto, I'm sorry, with the exception of Bitcoin, then that just completely obliterates all use cases because the point of, of crypto in general is the is the free flowing movement of tokens uh, so that's a problem now I think uh, the the powers that be the the institutions financial institutions in particular mm-hmm. they really want to have a monopoly on uh, the movement of money there, there's a current system that that has served them well over the years and and Candidly, and you won't hear a lot of uh, crypto enthusiasts say this, it's, you can make a case that it's served humanity well, this mm-hmm. idea of uh, the Federal Reserve creating currency and, and how that money flows, mm-hmm. it flows like a river. And policymakers and regulators kind of have influence with, with where it flows. Okay. And that system has worked to a point. Uh, personally, I think uh, we're at a point now where it's not working so well. And so crypto offers people uh, a way to own stuff outside of that system. They don't like it. Uh, it's competition. And so the institutions don't like the competition. And so Gary Gensler with the SEC is really protecting those institutions with the, with the pretense and the argument that uh, well, we're doing it for the, for the good of consumers. Mm-hmm. Not really. I mean, people are losing their butts in equities. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, they lose it. Uh, they, they lose quite a bit. Right. Uh, and currently, there is a wealth inequality problem. It's not a political statement. It's a fact. Right. So money isn't quite flowing efficiently. Uh, it seems to be concentrating in, in very few hands. So crypto is a way, in my opinion, it's for, for me, it's peaceful protest. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a way to own things outside of that system in a way that doesn't uh, further enable that system. I'm not all in. I'm not, you know, yo, I'm not suggesting people YOLO and, and, and go all in, but I, I do think a little bit of exposure is smart. So you still feel like there's pretty good prospects for the technology, for the space uh, moving forward. But I, I've heard uh, other you know experts say, hey, bumpy road, uh, you know, look at it like, you know, 2022, I think it was, was, you know, or uh, similar to the crypto winter of 2017, we came out of it. You know, it, this is a nascent industry. Um, it's it's going to be real, really bumpy, but you just, you know, have a long-term vision, right? And it, would, would you say that that's kind of like your your take on it? 100%. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's politically neutral because Democrats and Republicans own this stuff. So uh, at some point, Congress, which I, I don't know the likelihood of this happening, but they have to do their job and create rules that uh, specifically deal with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because the rules from 1931, they don't work. Uh, And so the the, the hope is, like we've we've talked about before, when something is well uh, plotted, Mm -hmm. uh, when it's a well-worn path, there's not much opportunity. This is not a well-worn path. This is a lot of gray, which could... could, um, mean there's opportunity. That's mm-hmm. how I look at it. It's a bumpy ride. It is not for the faint of heart, but I, but I think it's a very important technology in general when it comes to issues of financial freedom. That's a personal uh, opinion of mine where I, I don't think money and state uh, belong in, the, uh, in bed together. Right. We just, I, I know we, we could have a, in the next hour and talk about the, um, various forms of industry that were nascent in American history and how they, it was full of strife and discord and um, just perils 
uh, all from the, the the railroad industry, the steel industry, the oil industry. I mean, I know one of your favorite movies is There Will Be Blood. You know, the gold rush in California and Alaska. It's just like, any time that there was great opportunity, there's also great risk. I mean, both of those go hand in hand. Um, and so it's just, it, it, I find it fascinating. And I, I absolutely love looking at spaces where there is this, where there's great opportunity and, and trying to navigate it and learn from it and, um, you know, it reminds me of the, uh, the what was it, the, the Today Show back in at the very the dawn of the internet revolution when they were talking about the, you know, what is this email, what is this at sign? I don't understand this. This this, this is stupid, yeah. right? And just it's hysterical, and it's just to think, um, but it's just yeah, it's a, it's so much fun to to put yourself in the middle of those uh, those industries and uh, learn. So I just I, I'll definitely. I'll definitely have you back on at some point when you've got uh, other insights that you want to share with uh, listeners about what you're learning in the the blockchain technology space. But it is it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, one of the uh, two final questions I, uh, you've shared a little bit about some of your reading. Uh, your your wife has uh, told you that you are a better person, a happier person when you're reading. Are there any books that you have read with uh, recently that you're like, oh my goodness, this is a game changer? You know, I love this book. People ought to be reading it. I don't know if it, it, it's a heavy, it's a heavy read. It's on the history, the history of financial speculation. And it's a, it's about the history of bubbles okay. and it's fascinating how history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes okay. and how uh, throughout history uh, back to, of course, obviously the, the tulip bubble from mm-hmm. Amsterdam, but then the dot-com bubble in the South China sea. And it's just really fascinating how humans, we, we make this mistake repeatedly in mass uh, I, I find that kind of mind blowing and very informative. Um, how 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 money kind of pools mm-hmm. in 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 society, and then people just gamble. Yeah, uh, there, there's this instinct to 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 not miss out. That's an interesting book I'm reading. Uh, I'm also um, uh, this book that you got me. It's a uh, this is a very depressing title. The end of the world is just beginning. Oh my gosh, that is such a good book. I couldn't yeah, put it down. It's amazing. It's freaking amazing. Um, so I, I love geopolitics. I love history. I'm, I'm reading a book on Istanbul. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's I'm having fun. Oh, there's some great book recommendations. Yeah, the, uh, Peter Zihan, uh, he's also on Twitter and uh, has some stuff out there. Um, I think on YouTube, some YouTube videos. But if you ever get a chance, uh, for those that are listening to hear some, one of his presentations or definitely pick up that book. It is, it's a game changer. It'll help you see the world through a completely different lens. That It, it really changed my frameworks of how I view the world and especially what's going on uh, with China and with Russia right now. All right, final question. I, I'm, I'm waiting for the time when you tell me that you're getting involved in politics. You're running for governor of the state of Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, but well, I'm it, announcing my campaign for 2024. Bob. Oh, all right. This is, I, I, you know, I, we've told you, ladies and gentlemen, you get breaking news here on Taking the Leap podcast, and you just heard it right here, Kevin Thompson of Franklin, Tennessee. So you, when you are the president of the United States, or, uh, uh, the question has been of all of our previous guests, um, if you had the opportunity, the president asked you or you had the opportunity to give a State of the Union address to the American people, what would you say? Okay, well, in the three-hour speech that I'd give, yeah. I would make it a priority to, to tell people to make their health a personal priority, okay. make their health a priority. Okay. I, I think uh, a lot of people make life too complicated, mm-hmm. and when people are healthier, they have more energy and they feel better. I would start there. People want to talk about minimum wage. They want to talk about this or that, all very important subjects. But the one thing that I think could really impact somebody's life is just encouraging them to focus on health. And uh, and it's easier said than done. I understand that. But it's massively, massively important. Uh, And and I would also throw in there that I would attack Coca-Cola. I think Coca-Cola has done more harm for the human civilization than any consumer product uh, in history. And I drink a Coke today. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not holier than thou. I think it's harmed a lot of people Mm -hmm. when it comes to diabetes and obesity. And with COVID, you got me going. With COVID, we learned that people with these pre-existing conditions were really hurt the most. Mm -hmm. So I think personal health is massively important. My goodness. This this is brilliant insight. You're the first person 
who has used this opportunity to talk to the American people about personal health. And one of the reasons why I think it's brilliant and so insightful is because it also requires personal agency. It requires, it's the, it's the thing that most people want to avoid, which is I want to get up in the morning. I don't want to look in the mirror. I don't want to accept responsibility for my life. I want to become a professional victim and figure out who to blame. It's government. It's my neighbor. It's this, it's that. But when you focus on health and say, I'm going to take personal agency in my life for my body, for how I feel, it's all on you, right? You've got it, right? And, it, and if, and the reason it, it's such a brilliant insight. Nobody community. ever, government, they never talk about it. Yes. Yeah. And imagine um, every American focusing on themselves and their personal health and saying, I'm going to accept responsibility in this one corner of life. Uh, how it the, the ripple effect i think it was um was it mick raven uh, the, the former special ops commander he gave a, a graduation speech at texas a&m and he, he said you, you're you will change your life by waking up every single morning and starting your day by making your bed and again it's, an, it's another example of i'm going to take responsibility uh, but th- it, uh, that's a brilliant insight kevin i love and, and that's i know that that's something that you and uh, sharon are very much uh, you do for yourselves and you do for your kids. And it's a, it's a, a, a great way to end this podcast for people to take personal responsibility, your health, you'll, you'll love life and live better. It's like brushing your teeth and you don't have to crush it every day. Like Yako Wilnick or these other people online, mm-hmm. just do get, get 10,000 steps a day. Mm-hmm. I think people will be better for it. So I, that, that's my platform, Bob. That's why I will never win an election. <laughs> Well, we need, we, we, well, I'll tell you what, that's why, that's why we need you to run. We need, we need, Amer- we need Americans focused on personal responsibility and taking agency in their life. Kevin, thank you for taking the time. Speaking of taking agency and, uh, taking time, I appreciate you doing that today and spending time with us. This has been fantastic. I've learned a lot and this is the whole reason why I do it. I mean, if, if it was an audience of one, I'd do this for me just so I can ask cool people, you know, questions and I can take notes. It's great. I love it. Thanks so much. This has been fantastic. I love you, buddy. Have a great afternoon. Today's episode was engineered by Mitch White with graphic and marketing by Tristan Dickey. Special thanks to our guest, Kevin Thompson, for taking time to be with us. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcast. And if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or wherever you go to listen to your favorite pods. If you like the show, please share it with a friend and give us a review. That is always greatly appreciated. Thank you for spending time with us today. and We look forward to chatting with you next week.